Karen Bacher, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you for having me. So we're here, we're here to talk about your new book. When, when did it, um, The Sounds of Life, when did it come out? Yeah, it was published uh, in mid-October, 2022. Okay. Yeah, by Princeton University Press. Gotcha. So I, mean, I, have, I have so many like weird, tangential, deep questions about the book. At least I think they're deep, but I think for the for the benefit of listeners who, who are unfamiliar, maybe let's just begin with you introducing yourself and then we can talk a little bit about what's in the book and then we can go explore. Absolutely. So I'm Dr. Karen Bucker. I am a professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, and currently a Guggenheim Fellow and a Fellow at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Um, the book, The Sounds of Life, is a project I've been working on for about seven years, and it brings together research on animal and plant communication, sonic communication across a broad range of species from elephants and whales to turtles and moths and bats and coral and even um, the humble seagrass, uh, Posidonia oceanica, in telling the stories of all of the intricate sounds that those species make, I offer an argument which is the following. Thanks to advances in digital technology like bioacoustics and artificial intelligence, we are collectively making a pretty important scientific breakthrough that allows us to not only listen to but also decipher the intricate communication of plants and animals, much of which occurs at frequencies that are imperceptible to the naked human ear. And those breakthroughs give us remarkable new ways of observing life on planet Earth and actually put us on the cusp of an entirely new realm of scientific knowledge. Beautiful. So a, a couple of things. Um, first, I introduced you without the um, the title, Doctor, um, which I did because and I was I was one of the things I wanted to ask you is this like this is like one of the least egotistical books I've ever read by a scientist. So on the cover, you don't have PhD. It's just it's just your name, um, and like the, your the book is really talking about and honoring the work of all these other scientists. So one of the things I kind of want, maybe we'll, I'll just jump in because I'm so curious. Um, for a, you know, a scientist who has, you know, you've done a lot of work, I, there aren't even any papers of yours listed in the bibliography. What made you want to write about other people's work and center them and the work rather than, you know, your own research? There are a couple different answers to that questions, and I'll start with um, my own trajectory to writing this book. The entire project began when I went to Stanford for my last sabbatical, and I went with a pretty simple idea that inspired a lot of controversy. And the simple idea was that digital technologies are now technically capable of allowing non-humans to exercise political voice. They might not be able to vote in the way that we would think of voting, but certainly we're able to derive sufficient information about their preferences that they can provide meaningful input into our decision making. This, what I thought was a simple idea, met with such uh, sort of, you know, sort of alarm, outrage, or outright misunderstanding on the part of my fellow scientists, many of whom asserted that only humans possess language, only humans are capable of complex communication, and only humans are, are you know, um, really worthy of consideration from a political perspective, I decided I need to back up. <laughs> and I needed to go and answer these pretty fundamental questions about whether other creatures on Earth have anything meaningful to say. And of course, this is a very old debate. You go back to Aristotle, who distinguished between humans as having rational souls and, you know, um, animals don't have the same types of souls. They have sensitive souls. Plants only have vegetative souls. Thus said Aristotle and so on to Descartes, who asserted, you know, not only I think, therefore I am, but only humans possess reason. Animals are mere, mere automata. So I waited, right. which is which is which is why he tortured dogs, which is why he tortured dogs. So I waited into this debate 
through going to the empirical research on digital bioacoustics, which has proliferated over the past about 15 years. And the book is based on my reading of work by over 4,000 scientists across biology, ecology, engineering, acoustics, computer science. And on the basis of that pretty robust meta review and synthesis, um, I offer the arguments in the sounds of life, but it's, it's not the story of my own personal research journey as such. It's an attempt to um, make a much broader contribution to mm. debates in ecology and biology and um, the study of life as it, as it were, but also to longstanding debates in philosophy. And, and, and that's why it's not a book about me. It's about a, a book about what I think should be um, a, a widespread debate um, within and beyond the sciences about whether or not humans alone uniquely possess language mm. or the ability to engage in complex communication and what that means for our relationship to other species on this planet. I'll add one footnote to that because you asked, uh, you know, what brought me to write this book um, in an in an era of rampant misinformation and fake news. Um, I also think it's very important for scientists to tell the stories of science um, mm. and demonstrate the empirical rigor and what sets science apart um, for all of its faults and flaws and blind spots as one way um, of um, anchoring um, you know, public debate and dialogue, but also as one way of approaching the great mysteries this book is a meditative book as well as a scientific mm. book and i know that sounds a bit mystical and maybe off-putting for some of your listeners but by this i don't mean a religious point of view i mean actually just the sense of transcendence that arises when as a scientist you contemplate some of these great mysteries so i hope we'll come back to that angle as well in our conversation yeah because you know like since descartes science has kind of tried to bound you know to um fall over itself to basically prove that humans are automata without <laughs> emotion or or an ability to experience awe and wonder as well it's 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 hard to imagine you know your your fellow scientists when you're at stanford and you're, i think it sounds like you were advocating for we have ways of interpreting what the natural world is saying to us that we could understand as preferences like do none of them interact with dogs and cats uh, perhaps they do, um, but I think there is a certain siloing of one's personal experience from one's professional practice when you are trained as a scientist. So they don't call it scientific disciplines by accident. To become a scientist is to be disciplined in a habit of mind and a way of thinking, one aspect of which is to separate your personal life, my interaction with my dog, who appears to have emotions and is very intelligent <laughs> from my professional practice, um, which um, if you like, um, begins from a very narrow set of premises, um, which can be converted into testable hypotheses and proceeds very, very carefully, particularly around areas of great controversy, like the existence of non-human communication. Although one thing I do like to remind readers is if we put this in long-term historical perspective, I still believe the scientific method is a way of uncovering some of these truths about nature. And a great example is echolocation, which we understand to be quite widespread now, not only in bats, but other species. It was a very controversial discovery at the time, nearly 100 years ago. And I tell the fascinating story of how all of that unfolded at Harvard with this very unlikely collaboration between a, a top physicist at the end of his career and a, a, an undergraduate who barely passed his calculus class. And yet they collaborate to make these discoveries. And um, the discoveries at the time were met with disbelief and suspicion. They had their lapels shaken at conferences. You know, they were shouted at, which is in academia, you know, is about as bad as it gets. Um, some of the other researchers had their funding withdrawn, you know, people have been laughed at, sworn at, but, but um, the wonderful thing is the empirical studies can be done, they have been done, and they, they definitively and overwhelmingly show that complex communication exists in a wide range of species, and digital technology just accelerates these discoveries, and I wanted to share some of the excitement and joy of that in the book, like how wonderful 
to discover all of these curious and uncanny facts about other species. Yeah, and there's and there's such a um, you know a sort of hero's journey, a, a, a template of the of the scientists that you're profiling. And I love that you go into their personal lives, and you know it's not just you know reviews of their papers. Uh, but where, you know, a curiosity, a willingness to ask questions that they know or is not going to put them on the tenure track mm -hmm. to some degree or other, um, you know, being excoriated by the academy and ultimately at some point being um, exonerated and then sometimes honored. Um, it's, it's ironic because like one of the things you point out is that science wants to inoculate itself against craziness, like the you know, the, the aliens built the pyramids and, and, and so they feel like you know, we have to be really hardcore, but at the same time, being so hardcore to deny people the ability to ask what if questions and pursue them scientifically, I think promote, promotes a, a, a kind of skepticism where people can say, where anyone can say, hey, they, you know, science, the academy doesn't believe me, but they didn't believe Galileo either. And I think we're, science is shooting itself in the foot by forbidding people to ask certain questions. So this is a, one of the most foundational tensions in science. That is, there's a, a, a kind of understandable and perhaps necessary caution about adopting new ideas. That's why, you know, Thomas Kuhn could write about paradigm shifts in science as being so fraught, right? Balanced with the natural playfulness and curiosity of the scientific mind, and so th this is not, I think, an, a, a resolvable tension. It is rather kind of a tension we live with as scientists. Um, so, so my entry point into that in this book uh, is, is an insight that it's very, very difficult to, to walk this fine line where we want to avoid projecting human-derived concepts like language or consciousness on to other species. That would be anthropomorphizing. That would be inappropriate. But it's equally important not to deny the possibility that those concepts have analogs in other species. So the science tends towards the former, and that's a sin, uh, you know, um, sorry, that, that's sort of a, a sin of commission, and the latter is a sin of omission, right? We, we wouldn't want to project these concepts onto others. Scientists are really afraid of that. But as they're so afraid of it, they commit a sin of omission, which is refusing to even consider whether another animal might possess an analog to consciousness or language. And the book largely deals with the empirical research, as do most of these researchers who rigorously avoid talking about language and consciousness. Mm -hmm. But these results do open up a very interesting philosophical debate that I think updates um, sort of mid 20th century understandings. So Wittgenstein is famous for saying, if a, I'm going to slightly misquote him, I'm sure, but more or less paraphrase, if a lion could speak, we could not understand him. Right? Right. <laughs> Nagel's famous paper on what is it like to be a bat, a, a, the philosopher Thomas Nagel asserts that even if a bat had a sense of consciousness, that is a, a bat-like sense of what it means to be a bat, we could never understand whether or not that was the case because the bat is limited, it's constrained linguistically, it cannot convey its bat consciousness uh, con concepts to us in a language we could ever understand because our language is derived from an embodied sense of being that is so different from the bat. Our, our, our linguistic, um, if you like, uh, habitus is incommensurable. And the reason I think we need to revisit these um, very dominant viewpoints is because Wittgenstein and Nagel did not take into account the invention of digital bioacoustics that record large am amounts of data about animal vocalizations and sounds, much of which, you know, is in the high ultrasound beyond our human hearing capacity or low infrasound beyond our human hearing capacity. And they didn't take into account that we would ar have artificial intelligence algorithms that analyze those vocalizations for patterns and that can learn, if you like, the patterns and the vocalizations of non-humans. So my answer or rejoinder as a thought experiment to Wittgenstein and Nagel is, hey, we may never be able to speak like a bat, but maybe our computers 
can. And what mm -hmm. does that mean for the future of interspecies communication? And that's the cliffhanger that the book ends on um, right. as, as the philosophical insight to these, these very um, light, lovely studies about the, the intricacy of non-human communication. Yeah. Well, Wittgenstein and Nagel also didn't take into account thousands of years of indigenous knowledge. Yes. Where, you know, um, my, you know, my wife has studied um, Peruvian shamanism where they have the Icaros, the songs that the plants sing, and the shamans insist that they're, it's not metaphor, they're hearing not, the songs. That's right, that's right. So yeah. the, the that's right, and the book interweaves deep listening as traditional knowledge and digital listening, and many of the discoveries in the book are quote unquote, scientific discoveries are actually rediscoveries. So Robin Wall Kimmerer in her beautiful book, Braiding Sweetgrass, has this lovely quote where she says, you know, I smile when my colleagues say they have discovered X. That's <laughs> like C Columbus saying that he discovered America. Well, actually her view is that um, other beings hold this knowledge and as scientists, if we ask the right questions, they reveal the knowledge and indeed, in each of the species I look at, be it elephants or whales or turtles or bats, indigenous communities, or even fish, <laughs> the, um, the indigenous communities have actually had much more sophisticated understanding of communication in these species than Western scientists who are only sort of slowly and painstakingly sort of reproving or rediscovering what those communities have long known. Right. So I'd love for us to uh, to let the let the animals and plants speak through through you and through your research, so you have you know amazing chapters on sort of the history of bioacoustics and and you know the 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 digital revolution that has enabled all these things. But like I kind I kind of want to let that be a little bit of a pass through. People can read that in the book, but I really I really want to hear from you know these non-human species that you. I think so eloquently share uh, stories. Um, maybe maybe we can start with the whales. Mm -hmm. And I, and I and I do want to say I'd never heard of Roger and Katie Payne, but it seems to me like they've ch they have changed the world as much as any two people mm -hmm. ever in the, in the history of the planet. Um, maybe mm -hmm. talk about them and their story and what they started hearing. What what we know about whales from whales? Mm. Roger and Katie Payne were an unusual um, pair in part because of their willingness to ask the what if questions you mentioned earlier. So Roger actually trained under Donald Griffin, who was the person I mentioned earlier at Harvard who discovered bat echolocation. And in uh, the face of much scientific skepticism and, and disapproval actually demonstrated that bat echolocation was an amazing, amazing capacity honed by evolution to be more accurate and sensitive than our finest medical devices. And his discoveries occurred at, at the same time as sonar was being widely adopted. And it was pretty disturbing for many to hear that evolution had honed what humans had only recently sort of bumblingly discovered. Um, so Griffin becomes um, uh, the supervisor of Roger Payne, but Roger Payne grew up in an era when it, he was no longer content to study these phenomena in the lab. And he describes a, a moment in his, his biography where he's working late at the, uh, in the night um, in his lab and he hears the story of a whale being washed up on a, a local beach uh, on the Atlantic coast. He, he goes out to find the whale's body um, having been desecrated by, by people who came to visit who as the whale was dying, carved their initials into its flesh. Someone stuck a cigar, a still lit cigar into its blowhole. And he stood with this sort of desecrated body of the whale at a time when industrial whaling was still occurring. And that moment changed his life. And he decided that he uh, would step out of academia, continue to do research, but in a manner that would attempt to save the whales. The only problem was there were very few whales to be found because so many of them had been hunted to near extinction. And that is when Roger and his wife, Katie, who was a classically trained musician, found themselves um, in Barbados at the invite of um, someone who was himself a descendant of whalers 
who had secretly been recording whale songs for decades. You have to imagine this is all analog on these big old reels, right? Um, and uh, as a, a, um, at the end of his life, the, uh, he decided to confide in Roger and Katie Payne with these recordings, gifted it to them, and asked them, told them that their mission was to save the whales. Now, you can imagine how difficult this would be for a scientist in an era when industrial whaling was still widely accepted. And one of the thing, ro things Roger Payne did is um, to publish those recordings as a, a music album that went platinum, that remains the best-selling album of all time, Whale Song. You can still find it online. The haunting moving songs caught people's attention, were played at the UN General Assembly, were put on that gold record that went out into space, you know, that NASA sent mm. out into space with human sounds. To, if aliens ever receive it, they'll, they'll know that intelligent life on Earth uh, has humans and, as well as whales. And that led in part to an end in the nick of time for industrial whaling. But the most profound discovery they made was not any of this, but rather it was Katie's discovery. Um, the mother of four children at home, she prints out all of these whale songs with these beautiful spectrograms that are like um, graphical depictions of changes in sound frequencies. So you could have to imagine these all taped all over their living room walls and all over the house. And she began memorizing whale song and realized that whale song had very complex structure. It had stanzas and codas, It, uh, much like symphonic structure, had many layers of, if you like, um, structure and meaning. And that is what led to some publications in nature and science and led to the discovery of whale song as culture, the different dialects that exist in different whale groups, the fact that whales engage in vocal learning the parents teach um, whale language to their young and the further decoding of whale language such that we know um, cetaceans as well as dolphins have, for example, individual names. So mm -hmm. this leads us to discover the existence of complex communication and culture in another lar large brained mammalian species. And that was only the beginning of the modern uh, discovery of um, animal communication, but as as you say, a really significant one, and um, delightfully, it fell to a classically trained musician to unveil what most scientists had simply overlooked. Yeah, and you know another another sort of big theme that I drew from the book. It is it was so odd to read a science book in which so many of the protagonists are women. <laughs> You well, know, I, it was it was it was it was just uh, you know it was so so nourishing that usually oh there's there's one woman like but this was like woman after woman after woman and you know like not in position in, in, at the height of the academy but but you know doing their thing on the side or having this other background that would have been deemed irrelevant um, and I'm 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 curious like how you mm -hmm. think of you know it was like this it felt like a very feminist book like I want to you know give this to young girls and say like mm -hmm. go go do go do this don't just be scientists but be women scientists who mm -hmm. who bring something you know special to the table yeah the book does not mention feminism and it's it's not a that wasn't um you know sort of a deliberate um choice but I I do think it's interesting that many of the the most profound discoveries were made by women and I'll briefly mention a few Camilla Ferrara in Brazil, despite her PhD supervisor telling her she'd never get her PhD and being laughed at, she was the first to discover um, turtle sounds, not only that they're abundant and they're complex, but that they're pretty astounding. Um, turtle babies, uh, embryos make sound in their shell while still in their shells before they hatch to coordinate the moment of their birth. Mother turtles are waiting offshore making sound to guide babies into the water and then they also monitor the turtles with drones and, and tags. You know, the mothers are taking the baby turtles to safety to protect them from predators. So Camilla Ferrara, as a PhD student, not only discovers turtle sound, but also the first evidence of parental care in Chelonians because the male scientists had assumed the mother turtles just lay the eggs and then leave and don't even think about their children. So, I mean, there's a long, um, of course, history of women in field ecology 
from the three sisters, you know, uh, Jane Goodall and Virte Galdikas, uh, studying primates um, and, and under Leakey and uh, realizing that there were other attributes of primate societies, such as empathy and cooperation that male scientists had overlooked. This is revisited beautifully um, later by uh, historian of science, uh, Donna Haraway. So we have, a, we have a long tradition in field ecology of women coming into the field and having a different perspective. So I think you're right, it is no accident because it is perhaps the case that women coming into these very male dominated fields were often in a position where they were quietly listening and you you need to actually be quietly listening and have a body held in stillness to hear some of these sounds they're very subtle they're often turtle sounds for example are very low frequency very infrequent um and and perhaps you know uh their positionality meant that they were better listeners and also very aware that voices get marginalized although again mm -hmm. i don't talk about that explicitly in the book Certainly, um, the uh, the work of you know Mirjam Knorrschild on bats is another great example, where she was the first to discover that um, baby bats exhibit vocal learning. Mother bats babble to their babies just like human parents babble to our babies. Baby bats babble back. They eventually learn adult bat. They learn <laughs> to express many things, including um, uh, you know essentially functionally vocabulary units that are like words where bats have individual names they can distinguish genders kin and family identity they hold favors uh, they they hold grudges they trade food for sex they socially distance and go quiet when ill um, many of these sorts of discoveries of very complex bat behaviors and bat society open up when you you're um when you're, you begin to understand that bats engage in vocal learning just like we do. And so again, this is a, 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 a set of interesting discoveries that are perhaps made because we're approaching the topic with slightly more open minds. Yeah, and I think I, I, think I kind of want to make a, a sort of archetypal distinction, but you know, rather than saying like men and women, because your, your book really talks about, we have a choice between connection and domination, which is you know sort of to getting to the last chapter, like we have these technologies that can either allow us to dominate or to connect and listen. So if we think about sort of you know, the feminine is more connective and the masculine is more dominating. Um, I, like one of the things I was struck by starting with uh, the second chapter where you're talking about the Inupiat study, over about the is it bowhead whales is that, that's right yeah is that like these studies like I, I kept reading that thinking who the hell funded that who the hell went through with that like it's it just seemed like such an unlikely thing to ever have happened and it just it sort of reminded me of pregnancy like <laughs> like uh, so many of these studies were just like okay we're going to do something difficult over over a really long period of time, an unreasonable period of time without any expectation of what's going to happen. And it was like, you know, from dotting the honeybees to this Inupiat study where, the, you know, the ice flow could melt and they find themselves out to sea after having spent, you know, months trying, you know, have all like, like there was, there was something so sacred about so many, so much of this research in which, you know, humans really put the quest for con for connection above their own needs and egos. Well, yeah, there's a lot in what you just said, and I'll sort of begin by observing that one of the themes that runs through the book, because it runs through the research at the, you know, intersection and the intertwining of deep listening and digital listening, is that these technologies, like all human tools, present us with a choice. Do we choose com communion or dominion? Do we choose sort of kinship or ownership? Hmm. And these tools could be used to further domesticate species because we now have robots that can essentially decode and uh, non-human communication and perhaps issue commands, right? It, it opens the door to potentially domesticating species that were previously unable to domesticate 
or further exploit species we have domesticated versus establishing a, a deeper sense of re relationality, kinship, understanding. Um, and that uneasy tension flows throughout the book, but those who, whose stories I tell, which are largely the scientists who are seeking to understand the ways we can better connect, are, um, I wouldn't use the pregnancy metaphor. I would say there are two different senses of time that are at play here. There's chronos, uh, which is, you know, clock time, trains run on time time, mm. um, scientific time. And there's kairos. Kairos is the time of unfolding. Kairos is the time it takes for every, you know, for um, a bud to flower or a child mm. to be born. Kairos is, is, is organic time and Kairos cannot be measured in terms of Kronos. And in, in, in a world of fast science, in a world where we're increasingly pushed for um, to proliferate results in a smaller and smaller period of time, um, and more and more work is in the lab or modeling or computer based, you know, it, what is so lovely is to find this marriage of digital technology with these deep traditions of field science and as anyone knows who spent any time in the field studying animals it's kairos not chronos you cannot you cannot control when the birds show up when the whales pass by you know when the when um uh when mating starts uh, all of these beautiful cycles of life and i think that's what you're feeling um in the pages of of the book these scientists who sat for many weeks months years listening just listening for these animals and and some of that that's a very transcendent experience and some of that sense of transcendence kind of comes into the pages of the book even though it is a very scientific discussion mm. that feeling um that feeling is also there yeah so what one, one of the things that challenged me initially in the book was the the the, the story of the inupiat who wants who uh, an indigenous group in i guess canada who barrow alaska barrow alaska Okay, who who wanted to retain the rights to do um, subsistence hunting hunting of the whales? I'm a vegan. This is sort of a plant based podcast. A lot of you know, and I found myself halfway through rooting for the people who wanted to hunt whales against the International Whaling Commission. Um, can you just sort of like outline the the that story? Yeah. So the. This, and thank you for mentioning that this is a vegan podcast and I want to come back to that, but let me tell you the, the story first. Um, the Inupiat, of course, uh, as traditional owners of the territories of uh, at Point Barrow, um, sit at a, one of the most important biodiversity hotspots in the world. That is where the waters of the Pacific pass through a very narrow channel into the Arctic and at that particular spot, the upwellings of nutrients create such an abundance of zooplankton and phytoplankton that um, an, an, a wonderfully rich and diverse ecosystem, um, all the way from small fish to seals right up to whales, feeds on that abundance. It's akin to the biodiversity you would see on the African savanna. So you have to understand this place is wonderfully biodiverse and, and, and rich. Um, it's not often the way we think of the Arctic. We often think of it as cold, barren, and frozen, et cetera. So, so, um, but it's a jungle out there under the water. And the mm. scientists that the Inupiat invited up, as they began to listen, realized the, 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 not only the biodiversity, but the sonic diversity as all of these creatures are making these incredible noises, which the Inupiat could interpret. There's one anecdote told by Chris Clark, a scientist from Cornell, uh, the Inupiat would place a wooden oar against their jaw and then place the oar under the water. The resonance of the sounds through the wood, they could interpret, they would know which animals were making the sounds and why. So the very sophisticated understanding of, of this, um, what sounded to the Western scientists like cacophony. It is through these methods that the Inupiat knew that the bowhead whale population, which they do traditionally hunt, was actually increasing and rebounding after over a century of aggressive whaling by colonists that had nearly wiped out the bowhead population. Now their knowledge, their traditional knowledge, land-based, place-based, was discounted by the International Whaling Commission, which 
unilaterally without consultation imposed a ban on subsistence whaling based on the argument that the whales were nearly extinct and their data was derived from visual right. surveys. Yeah. So ba basically like we all, we've killed almost all of them. And yep. so now we're going to stop you from, from doing what you've always done. That's right. And the Inupiat argued a few things. One is that the whales were way more abundant than scientists realized. They were proven right using digital bioacoustics. They also argued the whales were um, profound, uh, profoundly um, skilled at navigating their way through Arctic ice, which the Western scientists didn't believe. Um, they uh, also argued the whales were very long lived, and this too was proven to be right. Some of the whales were over 200 years old. Scientists, all of those scientific prejudices fell one by one. And of course, whale song is also discovered in the bowheads who turn out to have complex culture, just like groups like the humpbacks. On the strength of this, the International Whaling Commission reversed course after the debate had traveled to the White House and beyond, and the Inupiat were given the subsistence right to hunt in perpetuity and acknowledgement of their stewardship, cl close understanding and kinship with the whales. And one of the things I talk about in the book is the fact that that kinship rests on a very different understanding of how one relates to whales and that um, that understanding operates at a level we would consider as intellectual or, or, or scientific, but it also operates at a physical level, hunting the whale, eating the whale, incorporating the whale into all sorts of tools and cultural practices like drumming. Um, one geographer uh, that works on uh, these issues calls this a concept of cetaceousness, which is analogous to consciousness. It's right, deeply which is, which is culturally Much nicer embedded. phrase than, than the cult of the whale, right? Yes, the yes. Anthropological. And so I leave it to the reader to judge, but the Inupiat also say that they are able to communicate with whales through dreams that just like you mentioned earlier, the shamans say the plants speak to them and the plants give themselves and their knowledge to humans. The Inupiat say the same thing about whales, and that is the close relationship that's evolved over millennia in the hunt, when a whale chooses to, to, give, to give itself to a human community that is both a very prosaic act of hunting and a very spiritual and, and, and cultural act. So, so that um, this is a very different sense of what it means um, to hunt than I think, uh, you know, we might think of in the West and I and certainly poses a set of ethical questions for vegans or vegetarians to consider when they're um, considering about, um, you know, their views about different cultures that do eat meat um, for cultural, spiritual, um, as well as pragmatic reasons. Yeah. Well, you know, when when you tell the story of uh, of Harry, the Inupiat elder, um, who was explaining that you know we will talk to the whale, and and some whales will run, you know they can run away if they want, but some of them give themselves to us, right? When they know that we're going to share and that we have respect, and he had he had, he had a dream from his hospital bed that, right, of a calf from a slaughtered mother that that changed how the Inupiat hunted from then on. Yeah, he, there's a beautiful book. Um, the title is The Whales, They Give Themselves. And in it, Brower, who's an, an elder, um, talks about uh, his, his dream. The dream that was shared with him came as a set of instructions, as well as a revelation about this particular calf. Um, whose mother had been killed. And from that dream emerged new rules restricting the hunting of mother whales with young offspring. The deeper meaning of this is that whales, according to the Inupiat, share, this, share some degree of consciousness with humans and um, that digital bioacoustics uncovers, if you like, the superficial layer of, of whale communication, but that there are many other layers of communication um, that are at play, not all of which are accessible to Western scientific methods. Again, I recount the story in the book in order to provide, com provide a complete account of in the Indigenous knowledge perspective on this issue. And I return to that issue again in the discussion of plants, because similar debates occur around plants. 
and I, and what I um, and I what I think is very interesting is that the scientific community is more open to having these discussions, which sort of occur at the boundary between anthropology and biology and ecology. In you know, we're ready to have these kind of conversations in a way that we weren't a couple of decades ago. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the elephants because I've I'm, I'm thinking about like as I read the book when I put it down and get up and and run and have to tell somebody something cool like you know and there's a there's a wonderful elephant anecdotes both about the their their response to honeybees versus um, human threats and you know the the male hunter voices versus non hunter um, but maybe there's a good time to like kind of dive into a little bit of like what and again, I think this is a this is a um, um, a Katie Payne discovery mm -hmm. um, about how to listen to elephants. Can you just talk for a minute just about like what bioacoustic and like what the technologies are? And sure. Before we get into the elephants. Sure. So um, there there are two sets of technologies here. One is called bioacoustics. The other is called ecoacoustics. So bioacoustics is a set of digital technologies that um, are miniaturized, automated, portable. The devices are now not much larger than your smartphone. And um, the simplest devices, you can even build yourself. There's one called AudioMoth, which M-O-T-H, AudioMoth, that's open source. You can order it online and you too can join the tens of thousands of amateur citizen scientists out there listening to nature. So these digital bioacoustics devices have proliferated and they allow us to do a couple of cool things. One is to listen to nature 24 seven, even at night, even in remote places, people are installing these from the depths of the ocean to the highest mountaintops, from the Arctic to the Amazon, continent wide arrays. This is like a planetary scale hearing aid that extends human listening capacity well beyond the limitations of the naked ear because much non-human communication occurs in the ultrasonic above our human hearing range or in the infrasonic below our human hearing range um, to give one example that might surprise people peacocks we think their mating dance is a visual display it is partly but it's also a sonic display peacocks are making very loud infrasound with their tails the tail the biomechanics of the tail act like a resonator the re the tail makes very powerful sound that vibrates the peacocks comb and the peahen's comb, the peahen is paying intense attention to how much sound the peacocks are making when they're, they're making their mating decisions. We only figured this out about a decade ago, and we've known about peacocks for millennia. Um, so, so, so being able to record all of these sounds is revealing just the vast extent of sonic communication, most of which humans didn't suspect across the tree of life. The next cool part of it is that we're able to use artificial intelligence to analyze the patterns. You and I could not understand bat language. It's too fast and also too high frequency. Our computers can easily decode it. And the analogy here is natural language processing, similar to what underpins Google Translate. And the final thing I'll note about the technology is you can apply those same ideas, not only to individual organisms but to entire landscapes so ecoacousticians listen to soundscapes the collection of sounds made by an entire soundscape they can read the sonic output of a landscape much like a radiologist would read an mri of your body and discover very subtle signs of health and disease so these are profound windows into our understanding of environmental health as well as non-human communication so on to elephants. What does this reveal about elephants? So when Katie Payne, after her whale discoveries, goes to Africa and arrives in the midst of an elephant genocide, when in some countries, nine out of 10 elephants had been killed for their ivory in the 1980s, she sets up building an elephant dictionary that is a collection of sounds associated with um, behaviors and meanings. And she and other researchers like Lucy King end up making some profound discoveries that elephants have very specific calls with a lot of informational content. One I like to describe is the fact that elephants have a very specific word for honeybee. 
Honeybees are terrifying. To, you might think it's funny, the, the tiny honeybee frightening the enormous African elephant, but they get into their ears and their trunks and their noses. And so elephants are pretty much more scared of honeybees than anything else. So the elephants have a very specific sound for honeybee, but another specific sound for human. And in fact, a very specific sound for threatening human versus non-threatening human. They'll, you know, male versus female, different tribes. It turns out they're describing us with greater accuracy in their vocalizations than we're able to describe them. <laughs> right, and, and one, one of the things she, the Katie Payne discovered was that you could hear the ultras ultrasound just by playing back the recordings faster. You could hear the infrasound. That's right. So elephants are making in very infrasound. low in infrasound, uh -huh. and you speed up the recordings, and 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 you and you'll hear those sounds. So they could be making those sounds right next to us. We would not hear them. Um, they're very loud sounds. Some of these sounds are the loudest recorded, you know, on the planet, and they completely pass us by until you mm. manipulate the sound. Um, so what we're now able to do is automate that recording and that sound manipulation and that so scientists are now working on the next stage, which is decoding those patterns, detecting um, complex communication, associating that with behavior, which is essentially um, a set of steps towards decoding non human communication and maybe the next step very controversial is actually speaking back to the animals interspecies communication and and that's sort of where the book concludes with the the research that that's going on right now attempting to break the barrier of interspecies communication right so you mentioned the honeybee fences uh to to help elephants and humans coexist in the yeah. you know, diminish in in habitat that now has to be shared because um so much of the elephant's habitat is gone and yes. whether, you know, setting up real honeybee fences or just sonic ones, I assume at some point the elephants will just say, well, that's not real. Yeah, I uh, the, the real honeybee fences are, are, are more efficient. They're also lower cost and the farmers get the bonus of the honey as well, in, as well as keeping the marauding elephants out of their fields. Th that's a great point. The book has lots of examples of how these um, bioacoustics technologies create practical conservation applications, because if... Um, another great example is the use of those uh, bioacoustics to locate whales in real time, to send that locational information to ship's captains, and the ship's captains then slow down or stop, they avoid the whales, and this reduces ship strikes, this reduces de whale death, which is actually one of the major causes of deaths of whales, notably endangered North Atlantic right whales or whales off the west coast of the US, you know, the Santa Barbara Channel. We basically are now using bioacoustics to create whale lanes that have priority over shipping lanes. Then scientists are now talking about scaling that up to the global level, which would make a huge difference to um, uh, protecting whales and enabling whales to, to, to rise in abundance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another really potentially promising technology is around restoring um, reefs, coral yeah, reefs. Yeah, that's one of my favorite examples. So not to give too much of the book away, but very briefly, one of the most wonderful sets of discoveries has, that has been made with using these bioacoustics technologies is the discovery that even species without ears or any apparent means of hearing, species are very sensitive to sound, more sensitive than we are. And I, there's a whole chapter on plants where I talk about the incredibly subtle hearing abilities of plants. But I also talk about coral larvae, and there's been some fantastic research done by Steve Simpson at Exeter that demonstrates that coral larvae, so these are microscopic blobs, to put it technically, they have no, they have no central nervous system, they're covered in hair, cilia. Um, you wouldn't think they could hear, but in fact, it, in experiments both in the lab and out in the ocean show that coral larvae prefer the sounds of reefs over other kinds of sounds. They prefer the sounds of healthy reefs over degraded reefs. And if given a choice, they prefer the sound of their home reef over other reefs chosen at random. So imagine this, a microscopic coral larva is born at one of these mass coral spawning events. They're very beautiful. They're like underwater fireworks. They often occur at the full moon for reasons we don't actually understand. The coral larva, you know, multicolored wash out to the open ocean so they can grow and um, escape predators. 
And then they have to eventually find their way back to a reef and settle and scientists used to think they were randomly pushed by waves and wind and currents, but no, it turns out they can hear the sound of the reef. And they swim towards it over miles of open ocean in order to settle this is like you know this is akin to the salmon migrations you know up hundreds of miles of rivers from the ocean to spawn in mountain streams it's a heroic feat and it's pretty astounding to think that these tiny little organisms are so so sensitive to sound and have such um sensitive hearing ability that far surpasses our own and scientists have built on this to then use this to regenerate coral reefs so what they're now doing is playing underwater sounds a bit like a coral reef dj healthy coral reef sounds it turns out if you play those sounds on coral reefs you can attract coral larvae you can also attract fish larvae and you can accelerate the regeneration of the reef which will not save every coral reef on the planet they are massively under threat due to climate change and ocean acidification, but it will at least help us save um, in a kind of triage fashion the coral reefs we're desperately trying to save. And um, it's, so it's, you know, music therapy for nature um, coming soon to a coral reef near you. <laughs> right. So what, one of the one of the books I kept being reminded of when I was when I was reading the the, the sounds of life is uh, Horton Hears a Who. Oh, Dr. Zeus. Right. Where, you know, the, the elephant in this case, the protagonist is trying to convince all the creatures who are out for, for blood or domination that, that these things that they can't hear or see are persons. And mm -hmm. it seems like, like, like you and this, this group of, of people that you are celebrating and, and highlighting and bringing to the fore are, are basically, you know, are basically saying like, you know, Non non humans are speaking to you know the world is speaking to us and we just haven't been listening and the, we scientists have been speaking to the rest of the academy and you haven't been listening and like and and you know like you talk about climate change and like whale stress and mm -hmm. you know the, the stress levels of all creatures including humans with with the din that we've created. Um, I guess the the question is like, what do you, what do you what are you hopeful for, given everything we know about the state of the planet and the state of human consciousness? Um, that you know, like what what can this deep listening at its best do for us and for, and for the, the the fellow our fellow beings? Mm -hmm. Robin Wall Kimmerer, whose lovely book Braiding Sweetgrass, I highly recommend to your listeners, has a lovely quote. It's the epigraph uh, from my book. She says, listening to wild places, we are audience to conversations in a language not our own. Um, there's another lovely quote um, from Leroy Little Bear, a Blackfoot philosopher who says, the human brain is like a station on the radio dial parked in one spot it is deaf to all the other stations, the animals, rocks, trees, simultaneously broadcasting across the whole spectrum of sentience. So this is something we once knew, but perhaps have forgotten. And science is one way of rediscovering this. Indigenous knowledge is um, holds that knowledge as well. And what I hope for, to answer your question, and uh, by writing this book, is to draw people's attention to the um, rich and profound nature of non-human communication across the tree of life, not just charismatic megafauna. And through a, an appreciation of the, I mean, the book is fun to read. It's delightful. It's surprising. And through seeing self in other, I think cultivating a sense of empathy for other species, a feeling of kinship with other species and a, and a, and a hope and desire um, and some tools to act in 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 different ways um there's an appendix at the back of the book that provides um ways people can get involved they can do um crowdsourcing citizen science they can listen they can use apps they can be out for sound walks there's lots of ways you can actually get involved in in listening to nature yourself and there's also um a, a kind of call to action to limit the onslaught of industrial noise pollution, which as I explore in the book is not only terrible for nature, 
but really pernicious for humans, the research that's now coming out about even the ambient levels of noise pollution in most cities that we would take for granted, increase our stress hormones, increase our risk of heart attack and stroke, cognitive impairment, developmental delays. There's a recent study out in Europe, a pretty large one, documenting the uh, relationship between um, traffic noise and dementia. Mm. So um, by quietening the human din, we would be doing ourselves a great favor in terms of human health, but also um, a really, really um, important thing for uh, sonically dependent species, particularly in the oceans. The one silver lining here is that as soon as you reduce noise pollution, the effects are immediate and persistent and significant. And we saw that during the pandemic, during the great anthropause, when huh. huma yeah, humanity went quiet, noise levels went down dramatically. And there were positive effects observed on lots of species. So for, through that natural laboratory ex experiment, unintended, we know that um, reducing noise pollution could have a, an enormous positive impact on biodiversity. And so it's, I hope it's one of the conversations that gets sparked by the book. All right. Um, I think we're gonna, well, let, let's end it there. I could just go through the entire book with you, but I, I do want to give people a reason to to read it because it is just beautifully written. Uh, it's it's it is a fun read with sort of cool anecdotes on almost every page. That you just want to go and share this stuff with other people. So the sounds of life is is truly one of the most exciting science books and ecology books and books about the human potential. <laughs> that I have ever read. And um, I just, I'm curious, like, what are you working on personally now that, now that you've birthed this, um, this ode to the field? What's, what's up for you? Um, well, I've been having lots of conversations. Uh, the book is the NPR Science Friday Book Club of the Month book this month, November 2022. Oh. And just um, just really enjoying the, the response from readers. So, uh, Beyond that, I my next project is uh, also asking questions about whether digital technology could bring us closer to nature rather than alienating us from nature and from one another. And that book is looking at the ways in which um, we could use digital technologies to solve some of our most pressing environmental problems, climate change and biodiversity loss. So again, mm -hmm. in a time of 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 trouble and strife and turbulence, um, I don't want to give false hope, but I do want to sound a note of cautious optimism um, about what people might do to, you know, just appreciate the the wonders of nature and to feel like there is something we can do about the challenges we're facing. Mm. I, and I love that both and approach because I have been I have fallen prey to. A very dichotomous view that you know that when I hear about you know the tech bros who are going to save us by building giant you know tubes to, to suck up carbon or like technology is what got into this us into this mess like let's not let's let's not use technology to solve it and yet in in this book and it sounds like in, in the work you're doing you're open to a kind of indigenously informed and perhaps even indigenously led technology, um, a wiser use than we perhaps we have had so far. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning that. Not being indigenous, it's always a fine line to walk. I want to amplify that, um, you know, the, the work of those amazing scholars like Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, there are others um, like John Boros that, uh, that, or Le uh, Leroy Little Bear that I cite in the book, but I don't want to recolonize that knowledge. Um, so what I will say is that, um, Science has um, much to learn, as do uh, um, tech innovators, about the ethical guideposts for um, um, for our, our relationship with nature, and that indigenous knowledge provides some very important guideposts um, in a world where innovation threatens to undermine um, not only in, um, environmental stability, but actually undermine the very divide between the artificial and the human. And mm -hmm. so I do hope that people not only read my book, but go and read these other books I cite by Robin Wall Kimmerer, by John Boros, by Dylan Robinson, by others, and sort of get deeper into that conversation.
Great. So I'll, I'll include links to those in, in the show notes. Um, so thank you so much for writing the book, for taking however the, the years it took to really um, explore and explain and, um, and for taking the time today. How can people follow you if they want to know more about you and your work? Yeah, so they could come to smartearthproject.com. Uh, that's or they could go to soundsoflife.org and there they could learn a little bit more about uh, the research and uh, some of the ways in which they could get involved. So again, that's the soundsoflife.org or smartearthproject.com. And it's not too late to go over to Science Friday and PR and join in the book club. I don't know when this is coming out, but Science Friday is doing a lot around the book as well. And I really uh -huh. welcome people to join that conversation. Great. I'll, I'll, um, I'll get this out as soon as I can and let people know. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation. Oh, me too. Thank you so much. It was great meeting you and I can't wait to, to read your next book.